A very warm welcome to you to the Center for International Law, National University of Singapore, COP26 special program on the issues and trends that are at front and center of the climate change conversation. I'm Danielle Yang, adjunct senior research fellow and lead on climate change law and policy issues at the center. As world leaders gathered in Glasgow last week for COP26, the prime ministers of Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu signed a historic agreement for the establishment of the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. The Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda currently chairs the Alliance of Small Island States, noted that small nations have become heavily indebted since they are forced to repair and rebuild infrastructure that has been continuously damaged during catastrophic natural disasters. The Prime Minister of Tuvalu is reported to have said that climate justice is a matter of survival, and it is time now to put words into action to save small island states and to save the world from impending disaster. To discuss this latest development, we are very privileged to have with us today Professor Payam Akavan, who is the legal counsel to this new commission. Professor Akavan is a professor of international law and a senior fellow at the Macy College, University of Toronto, and a member of the Permanent Court Arbitration. He was formerly a legal advisor in the Office of the Prosecutor the, to the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. Professor Akavan was previously a full professor at McGill University, as well as a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Toronto. In concurrently, concurrently, he holds other appointments at the Yale Law School, Leiden University, Oxford University, and the Science School, just to name a few. He is a member of the Law Society of Ontario as well as the New York State Bar and is a recipient of the Law Society of Ontario's 2021 Human Rights Award. He has appeared as counsel before the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, as well as the European Court of, Just Court of Human Rights. In addition to that, many, many activities, he also serves as a senior advisor to the Ministry of Global Affairs of Canada and is a senior fellow and the Canadian co-chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and co-founder of, uh, of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. And we're very privileged to have uh, Professor Akavan join us today. Good morning, Professor Akavan. A very well welcome uh, to the program. Now, um, and thank you so much for setting aside uh, your busy schedule to, to have a, a chat with us on this. I understand, of course, as counsel, um, it will not be possible to comment on specific legal issues of, of, and substance of this stage. But nonetheless, I do appreciate whatever general comments you may be able to share. Um, it is a very new development, um, this, this, this commission and this agreement, just hot off the press last week. What can you tell us regarding this new, new commission? Um, you know, has been established with its own international legal personality. Already it is along the corridor, I've been asked by other delegates for my views on what I think this commission is going to do and what it can do. So there is a lot of interest, even though perhaps uh, not quite hitting the airways yet. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be speaking through you with the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. Um, as you know, the commission was established uh, on October 31st, on the opening day of COP26, and the original signatories were the prime ministers uh, of Antigua and Barbuda, who um, happens to be also the chair of AOSIS currently, and the prime minister of uh, Tuvalu. Uh, on November 4th, the president of the Republic of Palau deposited an instrument of accession, so now there are now three members uh, at the commission and uh, several others are actively considering at this stage uh, acceding uh, to the agreement. And I think that uh, this is an idea which has been tabled for quite some time. Um, and there is obvious advantage uh, to having such a body. There is strength in numbers. 
And uh, what individual small island states cannot do in isolation, they can do by uh, grouping together. And while EOSIS has provided the framework uh, on the diplomatic front, uh, this commission now uh, uh, allows for a cohesive approach towards issues of climate change and uh, international law. Uh, those uh, include a very broad range of potential activities which fall within the Commission's mandate, ranging uh, uh, from uh, exploring the progressive development and implementation of climate change and international law, um, and in particular, pursuing um, uh, litigation before international courts and tribunals, including before the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, one thing that I should add is that um, I have been asked uh, by the uh, co-chairs of the Commission, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu, to assemble um, a world-class uh, committee of legal experts, and um, that will hopefully soon be uh, announced. And um, I'm uh, very pleased to say that there has been an overwhelming response by uh, highly reputable jurists in the field of um, environmental law, law of the sea, and other uh, relevant uh, uh, areas, and that these jurists really come from across the world, and they are uh, really representative of uh, the entire international community, including in particular the global south. Very often the international law uh, community speaks about the global south, but does not include jurists uh, from the region. So we hope that this will now create the basis um, for taking the next steps, which are to develop um, uh, some sort of uh, strategy as to how best to channel these collective efforts uh, in furthering the uh, interests of small island states. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kavan, for sharing that. Uh, very, very exciting developments uh, just within the space of a week from the first announcement. Uh, from what you've shared with us, it, it looks like the membership will be growing and, and no doubt um, it, it has attracted the interest um, of other um, small island states, um, as well as others perhaps outside the small island uh, states grouping who are looking at it perhaps with a mix of interest and perhaps also with a mix of um, this quiet as to what it may do. So it would be a very interesting uh, uh, time indeed. And, and, and I, I, I actually did want to uh, touch on, on a little bit more on the considerations. Um, you spoke briefly about what drove um, the establishment of this commission. Uh, the preamble, um, as I noted, references at some length to the uh, catastrophic effects of climate change on the survival and existence of, of, of small island states. Uh, and the intention actually to take immediate action um, what can you tell us about, you know, these other considerations? I mean, there, there has been, you know, obviously this is an issue of concern, of grave concern to the international community, and particularly to small island states, given that, you know, sea level rise can actually threaten their existence. But has the process um, of the international discussions not sufficiently advanced? And what, what really has, has mm -hmm. precipitated this move to a very innovative a mechanism, if I may, if I may say so. Are you able to share a little bit more about the thinking behind, the rationale behind? That's a very good question, Daniel. And I think that the uh, press statements that have been made by the prime ministers of uh, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu respectively explain what the motivation is behind this initiative. Um, small island states are tired of uh, vague commitments and uh, empty promises. Uh, and uh, some remarked that the only concrete measure to come out of COP26 was the agreement to establish this commission of small island states. Um, <laughs> and uh, from the vantage point, uh, let's say, of a Tuvalu, a country that in the next 10 or 20 years could mm -hmm. disappear, could become uninhabitable, uh, the sense of urgency um, and the sense of justice looks very different than it does elsewhere in the world. Um, so in a sense, um, these small island nations have nothing to lose now by 
invoking the legitimacy uh, of international law um, in their struggle to achieve climate justice um, because the UN framework convention process uh, has proved inadequate for uh, many of them. So, so this is really the, the, the motivation. And as I said, for some years, many colleagues have talked about establishing uh, such a body. Uh, 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 many have proposed requesting advisory opinions, whether from ICJ or, or ITLOS. And perhaps it just happens that um, now the planets are aligned. And <laughs> finally, uh, uh, two governments stepped forward and said, enough is enough. We have to move forward on this front. Uh, and uh, others are now um, going to join this effort. And I think it's very important to increase um, the membership uh, of the commission uh, to give it the sort of uh, uh, representation that it needs to really convey on a global scale the perspectives and concerns of all small island states. Thank you very much, Patakavan. I mean, in a way, it kind of reminds me of the trend, really. We've seen a huge growth in climate uh, litigation, uh, uh, take actions taken within uh, domestic jurisdictions against governments, and, and also in the European context, uh, based on human rights and things like that. Um, so it is, it is a tremendous growth um, in that area. Uh, and as you quite, uh, as you have pointed out, there, there is now this, this particular area here that this commission seeks to, to fill, so to speak. Um, if I may refer you to um, Article 2.1 of the agreement, and it talks about uh, one of the functions of commission as, as being promoting uh, the progressive development of rules and principles of international law regarding climate change. How do you anticipate the commission to be involved in, in the progressive development? Um, are there potentially plans to perhaps set up uh, studies or review boards, a little bit like the ILC, but looking at the progressive development specifically in the area of climate change. Uh, I guess this leads to the broader question of where, what are the really intended outcomes of this commission, broadly speaking? Those are all very good questions, Daniel, and they will all be determined by the members of the commission. Um, the commission is merely a vehicle for collective action by small island states uh, on the legal front. And uh, as the membership increases uh, and the uh, commission members um, in consultation with the committee of legal experts uh, formulate um, a, a strategy and approach towards um, their most pressing concerns and how they can best be realized, one could envisage a very broad range of interventions. Uh, this could include uh, um, uh, studies, uh, submissions to expert bodies, um, contributing to the work of the uh, International uh, Law Commission, uh, right. requesting advisory opinions before uh, ITLOS uh, or uh, uh, the ICJ, um, um, proposing uh, treaties, um, new standard setting activities. So really the sky is the limit, but the important thing is to emphasize that that decision is not for me as counsel to make or for the legal committee uh, that will soon be established, but it is for the commissions, uh, for the governments and peoples of small island states to decide what is in their best interest. And uh, our job um, as counsel is merely to enable and assist them in that process uh, using this new vehicle. Uh, thank you. That's very interesting. You mentioned the sort of a legal committee. That would be the kind of the panel of experts I referred to in the earlier part of your comments? Or is that a separate sort of a standing internal legal team within a, a, a secretariat or something like that? Uh, well, it is uh, what I uh, indicated earlier. It is a body of uh, highly uh, reputable jurists with very diverse um, range of uh, expertise and experience who would be available to the commission members as the need arises to um, advise them on uh, various uh, issues, 
uh, and should the need arise to represent them in proceedings uh, before uh, international courts. And as you mentioned, there is now a flurry of climate litigation before national courts, uh, before the uh, European Court of Human Rights and, and other bodies, before the UN um, uh, treaty bodies, such as the Committee on the Rights of the Child and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it is uh, really quite important for there also to be proceedings um, uh, in uh, interstate uh, courts and tribunals uh, to develop the law uh, at the interstate level. So uh, this commission fills in that gap in respect of small island states, which despite their um, small numbers <laughs> Uh, uh, and despite uh, the fact that they are not, you know, among the most um, uh, powerful states in the international order, uh, do have a disproportionate influence on the development of this area of law because they have the most to lose. Mm -hmm. um, so there is here also a David and Goliath aspect of the smallest of nations um, rising up, speaking truth to power, steering the conscience of the world. And in this instance, using the force of international law in order to reframe climate change issues um, in terms of uh, legal obligations uh, rather than uh, merely uh, negotiations uh, which are dependent on the whims of the major polluters. Uh, thank you for that, uh, that for, for comment. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just, if I may, just press this point a little bit, if I may. Uh, the timing of the announcement is, is is, is of course uh, coincides with, with what is arguably uh, a COP post Paris that is the most watched in the, and really the, one of the highest attendance in terms of COP, in terms of registered uh, participants for There's so a lot of interest in what is going to come out of this discussion. Now, I, I wonder how you see this commission process sitting alongside this COP, UNF, uh, UNFCCC and Paris Agreement process. Now, we're now in the second week of COP. And the discussions of the agenda item, let's say on loss and damage, is one of the few issues, uh, one of the few remaining issues that's been elevated to the ministers uh, this week. And I mentioned loss and damage, was, that was also mentioned in the preamble to this agreement with some amount of emphasis. Um, and, and, and I do wonder, I mean, in one view could be that this agreement, and the release of this agreement, that the timing of this agreement uh, could influence or even impact the process positively or negatively, it might undermine or be some sort of external pressure. Now, this could be, a, I'm not saying that it is, but it could be one of the uh, questions that have been raised. Would you be in a position to comment on that? How do you see these two processes sitting together at all? Mm -hmm. Well, um, anything that I say would be speculative, but yes. it is very obvious that uh, the work of the Commission, including potential um, litigation, generating a jurisprudence which uh, frames uh, issues of climate change in terms of legal obligations rather than uh, politi purely p political negotiations, um, uh, 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 in which uh, case, of course, uh, small island states are at a significant disadvantage. So international mm -hmm. law, as we know, um, is very often the equalizer for small nations. Um, who would otherwise lose out um, in the world of power politics. So it is very obvious that the framing of climate change issues in terms of legal obligations will have an impact on uh, future uh, COPs. And it's also obvious that um, both Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu and other small island states, uh, Palau included and others who will join, are deeply frustrated uh, by um, the empty promises which have yet to be fulfilled, uh, the pledge of $100 billion in climate finance in Copenhagen in 2009, which is yet to materialize and which today is arguably grossly inadequate to address uh, the scale of, of the damage, the ongoing debate about whether the issue of damages should be discussed at all. Um, in the uh, framework um, of the, the convention. So obviously all of these elements are at the forefront of the minds of those small island states who are behind the establishment of the commission and who now uh, are anticipating what sort of 
future activities it will uh, undertake. But it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen how, uh, if you like, the force of international law, and this is, a, of course, a question for all of us who are students and practitioners, what is the force of international law when one doesn't have proper enforcement mechanisms? Um, but from the point of view of these islands, many of whom are literally disappearing under the sea, what have they got to lose by trying? And this is what I heard time and again. We have nothing to lose by trying. We will invoke as a last ditch effort <laughs> the power of international law um, and uh, uh, hope that it will somehow help uh, create a greater sense of uh, urgency and commitment to doing what is necessary and right to address uh, this very dire situation for small island states. Thank you, uh, Professor. I think that is a, a, an excellent point for us to really conclude this discussion as well, because one of the main uh, narratives uh, that has come out from this COP so far, at least, has been, at least from a personal observation, the resurgence of multilateralism, uh, a resurgence of rule of law, which has been uh, somewhat dysfunctional in the last one, two years. Um, and uh, we will see how this plays out in this forum. We have a couple more days to go to this week, uh, and we will have to, uh, everyone is waiting with greater breath what the ministers are able to come up with uh, in, this, in, in this discussion this week. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I am very, very appreciative and we're very privileged for you to be here and sharing really news which is literally hot off the press news. Um, and thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to a future opportunity when time and per opportunity permits where we can engage in a more in-depth discussion um, of the road ahead, let's say, for, for this commission and what the outcome could be uh, and what the uh, results would be of the work or the fruits of this initiative. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Danielle, and uh, it is a, a, a great uh, adventure. We don't know where it will end, uh, but at least we can say that we tried, and I hope that this will be able to help uh, small island states in, in their struggle for climate justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that was a, a very illuminating conversation uh, with Professor Akavand. Um, now, as we reflect now, the question is really what can we expect to see uh, from the Commission going forward? Um, while this initiative will no doubt be welcomed by some states, it, it will probably attract its fair share of detractors from others. The Commission's next move will be closely watched uh, for its contribution to the interpretation and development of climate change law as well as uh, no doubt this interplay with the law of the sea and possibly even human rights law. There may also be systemic considerations surrounding the larger landscape in the order of the international dispute resolution framework. Further developments on this initiative will no doubt be closely watched. Thank you for joining us on this conversation today. Good day.